from what I understand from Professor Steve Ferber, part of the idea of reducing instruction sets was to do more stuff in software. Is that, am I going along the right lines there? You absolutely are. So the original risk principle, reduce instruction set computing, is you should never do something in hardware that you can do in software because uh, you keep the hardware simple, uh, you keep the hardware low power, high efficiency, you don't waste um, time and effort and, and watts, joules, uh, doing things that you could just do in software. Well, we've put a few wrinkles on that since. We needed to put things in hardware that were too complex to get right in software. So if it's really, really hard to guarantee um, that you've got it correct, probably the best place to do that is the hardware. About 12 years ago, I came to work directly for ARM, so I'm not one of the really early boys at all. Um, I knew several of the founders myself, they were friends and still are, um, but I only joined about 12 years ago. At the point at which ARM was realising that it had to take software a whole bunch more seriously, um, and we just designed a multi-processor CPU, so we had more than you know, multi-core CPUs, and putting those together um, was introducing some complexities in the software, and the Linux movement was really taking off big time, and so companies had to work out who was going to write this, who was going to support it, how do we encourage other people to use this software once we've sent it out there in the world, um, and it was, it was a really interesting time. It was the right time to come in for that. And I worked very much at the junction of software and hardware for many years. So my counterpart on the hardware side, you know, he, he and I would have long discussions about, well, we could do this, and why can't you just do that in software? And, and you know, we'd always go around in arguments like that. My understanding of that from a video point of view is quite often it's easier to have a hardware decoder to make sure that you can play video smoothly. Is yes. that the sort of thing we're talking about? A absolutely. Um, so we have a business in the media processing group doing hardware decode and hardware encode. And the answer is that we can build specialist hardware to do it much more efficiently than you could do it in software on a CPU. It's 10x, 10x the sort of... Now, 10 times is that? Yeah, 10 times. So it's interesting, these things change all the time. So when, um, when we were in the realm of MPEG and CPUs got really good, it looked like, oh, it's not worth doing this anymore. But actually, we then went from MPEG to H.264 and then went from H.264 to HEVC or H.265 and we've traded computational complexity for compression ratios. So now nobody would think of doing HEVC in software, it's just, just too hard. Um, and you would have very low frame rate or very high power or it would just be horrible. Uh, you do it, do it in a, a specialist hardware block and you can guarantee you know, our, my hardware block will decode you a frame of HEVC in exactly that number of milliseconds, come hell or high water. So uh, you sometimes can't do that with software. So you can basically build in assumptions because you yeah. know the statistics. You, you, you can, and we do, we, we work absolutely to the worst case, and we say, well, what is the most complex frame we could reasonably receive? It's this, okay, can we decode that in less than a frame's worth of time? Yes, we can, you know, and we prove it. Uh, it's harder to do that with software. What does the most complicated video frame look like? <laughs> oh, um, so, all right, digital video, uh, works on compressing an image. So you start with, uh, if it's a 1080p frame, you've got 2,000 pixels, all of which has a color which is expressible as 24 bits or something. And so that's quite a large quantity of data. If you were streaming that data, that would be a lot of megabits per second. Completely unfeasible, just doesn't work. So what we do is we compress the video down. And to do that, what we do is we observe that from, if you right, take a picture and you look at that, how much of that picture actually changes in a 30th of a second? So you're, I don't know what you're looking at. Let's say you're looking at my, you know, my head and shoulders. Yeah. Um, what of that is actually changing? Well, actually it's mainly my mouth and I'm waving my fingers from time to time. You know, the shirt's not changing, the background behind me, the wall certainly isn't changing. And so what, it, what we do in digital video is we if work If only out, I was using a tripod. <laughs> if only you were, you, uh, to be honest, if you were using a tripod, your videos would be smaller. What we do is we work out which bits change, work out which bits don't change, and often what happens in video 
is the bits that change, they don't really change, they move. So you go, well that bit was there on this frame and that bit is there on that frame. And so what we do is we encode the difference by saying, well it moved in that direction, that far, and then when it, by the time it got there, the colors were slightly different. So you, you, you produce the deltas of the colors, the direction of the motion vector, uh, the length of the motion vector, and you encode all of that down into a bunch of numbers and you transmit those. That's how digital video works. And it's all much of a muchness. There are lots of different compression standards, but the elements are the same, uh, which are that the eye doesn't see most of those changes are very, and it's much more sensitive to certain types of things than it is others. So if it's uh, brighter or darker, the eye is quite sensitive to that. If it subtly changes colour, the eye is less sensitive to that. And if it moves, the eye is incredibly sensitive to that. So we trade those things off against each other in different compression standards. So that's why if somebody sees a glitch when they're watching a streamed video, you see some of the screen stay where it is and maybe some... Yeah. It basically is a problem with receiving the data or something. Yeah, so what usually happens is um, you leave the previous frame up and then replace it with each bit of new data that you receive. So if the data stream gets corrupted, you usually get a bit of the last frame, on, and this one on top of the last one. And you, your eye doesn't like that, because if, if you, particularly if you're watching motion, you, you think, yes, my hand should move slowly across like that. And if my hand goes like that, you think, oh, that's wrong. Um, and if there's any sort of sparkle in it, so you get sort of points of bright white light in the middle of it and things like that, eye is incredibly sensitive to those sort of areas. So better compression standards and better implementations um, have special features in it to try and smooth out the errors. So basically these compression standards are tailored for human eyes, I'm guessing? Yes. If you talk to the guys who invent this, they talk about the psycho-visual um, understanding of how the eye works. And there's still fundamental research going on into how the eye and the ear, because we do the same sort of thing for audio, is how the brain actually works. Because if we knew how the brain really worked, as opposed to how we thought it worked, we could probably do a better job of this. So there's plenty of scope for getting this better in future. A lot of very clever scientists working on it. By subtracting these frames from each other, we can virtually shroud the influence of daylight. So we can even eliminate cast shadows which would be cast by direct sunlight.